And here we are in Mark chapter 12. Okay, Mark chapter 12, and we're picking it up in 28. Mark chapter 12, verse 28 says, And one of the scribes came, having heard them reasoning together, and perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, Which is the first commandment of all? So, this scribe comes to Jesus, the scribe, excuse me, not this scribe, but a, a, a community of scribes, come to Jesus and they question him. Now, how many know that they were questioning him on the on the uh, validation of who he is well they were sort of questioning him to challenge who he who he uh pro professed himself to be so their question that they were bringing to him was such an intense question that based upon jesus's answer would in fact validate or unvalidate or disvalidate or i don't know how you would communicate that or or make him invalid to be the Messiah. Did you know that? Based on how Jesus would answer this question would in fact help us perceive whether or not he loved God even. Whether or not he was revealing who the Lord is. If you look at here in 29, Jesus answered him. The first of all the commandments is Shema Israel Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Or as it's written here, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is like, namely this, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. And the scribe said unto him, Well, Master, you have said the truth, for there is one God, and there is no other but He. And to love Him with all the heart, with all the understanding, and with all the soul, with all the strength, and to love his neighbor as himself, is more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that He answered discreetly, He said to him, You are not free far from the kingdom of God and no man after that dare or durst ask him any more questions when Jesus responded to their question of validation he responded with what they call the Shema with what they call the call to listen and hear and take heed the greatest commandment of all is to love God all your being, all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. I love it. And Jesus says here in verse 30, you shall love the Lord your God. First of all, he makes it simple. He says, look at God is one. Don't be, un, don't be uh, confused in your affection. Know that the Lord, he is one. One God, one Lord, one Spirit, and Jesus, the Son of God, has come to reveal the one true living God to us. And when we receive the Son, we receive God. If you believe in the Son, you believe in God. If you do not have the Son, you do not have God. You know the Word of God says that? So Jesus makes it clear. He, he echoes the Shema that was given to Moses. He echoes it. Listen. Take heed. Take this in. Hear, O Israel. And Israel is really a picture of covenant people with God. You can't get more covenant with God when it comes to a people than Israel. And Israel is really the natural, the natural roots of the olive uh, when it comes to covenant. And, and the power of God's commitment to Israel is so intensely more even powerful when we embrace the Messiah in reality. Now, I'm not, uh, I'm not, I don't believe in replacement theology, which says, you know, the church replaces Israel. How many you know that, that all Israel shall be saved? As a matter of fact, the bride of Christ is very much Israel and all those who put their faith in the Lord, Jew and Gentile, coming into this. In reality but we can learn from the natural roots of our faith by gazing into the things that God expressed to his covenant people Israel 
How many know that we have a new covenant? Amen? Through the Messiah, through Yeshua, through Jesus, the Mashiach, we have covenant with God. And the root of the covenant is love for the Lord. Do you know that all that we do for God? Do you know that the Word of God says that knowledge puffs up, but love edifies? Do you know that? Sometimes we can be so... Okay, like for example, in this scripture here of Mark 12, let's, let's look, look, dive into this really quick. Looking here in, in, in Mark 12, verse 30, Jesus says, okay, not, not only is the Lord one, He says, and you shall love the Lord your God. With all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength, this is the first commandment. Now, when the uh, scribes respond to Jesus, they say in verse 32, the scribe says unto him, Well, Master, you have said the truth, for there is one God and none other but He. And listen to verse 33, You shall love Him with all the heart, with all the understanding, and with all the soul, with all the strength. And to love his neighbor as himself is more than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. Now, the thing about it is when Jesus speaks about the great commandment, he says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your mind, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind and your strength. And when the scribes respond, they say you should love him with all your heart, with all the understanding. Now, do you know that there, that understanding is of, is of essence when it comes to the mind? But in these wordings that are used here in this, uh, in this uh, expression or response that Jesus gives, he doesn't use the same terminology that the scribes use. When the scribes say, love God with understanding, this speaks of natural intellect which is good, you should love God that way, but when God speaks, when Jesus speaks of loving the Lord with your heart, soul, and mind and strength, when He speaks of mind, it's very unique from intellectual uh, perceptions alone. As a matter of fact, He embraces imagination and all the internal aspects of the thinking area as well. If you look up that Greek word for mind, you'll see that there's a different terminology, which also I'm sure if you catch it in the Hebrew, you can discover even greater. What does it mean to love God, not only in a humanistic aspect, but God wants us to go deeper beyond intellectual things? If you look with me here in um, Ephesians, come on, sometimes we can serve God with our intellect. It's okay, come on, we've got to use our head here. But how many know that God wants to take us past the knowledge of a thing in respect to, um, in respect to human acquirement of intellect? God wants us to be a, a worshiper in spirit and truth. People can touch on God's Word from an intellectual point and completely miss the spiritual intellect that God wants us to submit to when it comes to loving Him with our mind. You know that. People challenge the authenticity of God's Word through human study. They intellectually approach it and even find flaw based on their intellectual perceptions of what God's Word is conveying. But when you got the author, when you have the Spirit who wakens your mind internally, then in the Spirit we can truly love God the way He's called us to love Him. Do you know that God has empowered us with the ability to love Him with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength the way that we could not do apart from the Spirit of Christ? This is intense. Come on, you got to stay with me here. Come on. God has given us the ability to keep the commandments in the way that He mannered it, in the way that He brought it. Now, through Christ, we can truly love God the way that He's called us to, without flaw, being born of His Spirit. Look at here in Ephesians um, chapter 3. This is Paul's prayer here. Ephesians chapter 3, listen to this. Come on, we're, I'm just flowing here. We're just flowing with, uh, as the Spirit may uh, proceed in this. Uh, Ephesians chapter 3 verse 14 says, This is Paul, an apostle. He's speaking here. He's praying here. He says, For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is intense. This is intense. Paul is bowing his knees onto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is intense. How in the world? You know, you know how many know that if a, if a man prays with having his head covered, he dishonors his head. 
So how many know that Paul is not in any way implying that he's not coming to God through Christ? How many know that? He's not somehow, okay, Jesus, uh, thank you for saving me. Now I'm going to really, come on, show us the Father now, Jesus. <laughs> That's not what he's saying. Come on. Without Jesus, you can't come to God. He, he's showing you that he's going straight through the Lord, right to God the Father, because we have a mediation, which is in Christ Jesus. Look what he says here. He goes right to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, verse 15, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. This is intense. Do you know that God loves us so much that he has named us? God has named us. God has called us family and named us. You know, even I think in one place in Scripture, the Word of God says that we're going to get new, a new name even, and that even Jesus is going to have a new name. This is intense. Only certain people will know about His new name. This is intense. Look at verse 16. And He's, and he's speaking here, that He would grant you according to the riches of His glory to be strengthened with might by His Spirit in the inner man. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ, our Mashiach, or the Messiah, which passes knowledge, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. So... He's praying that the Lord would so dwell in where? In our hearts. By faith. That we would be rooted and grounded where? In love. This is so intense. Jesus so intensely desired this for us. Paul is only picking up on what Jesus prayed uh, for us in John 17. Uh, Lord, that the love that, is, that we have together, that the love that is in me may be in them. I think it says it along those lines. Jesus communicates. And as we come into this rooting and grounding into the love of Christ, it, this very love of Mashiach, the very love of God, the very love of the Messiah, takes us past knowledge. It surpasses knowledge. Come on. How many know that people today put, uh, put, um, put, uh, put uh, honor on those who seem to be of intellect stature? But reality is, the majority of uh, the really renowned uh, disciples of Christ were unlearned and uneducated men. Did you know this? Don't feel bad if you don't seem to be so intellectually whipped or, or so uh, expressively uh, communicative in your words of wisdom. The Spirit of God is able to take and use those things that may be seen less noble to bring about His greater glory. Does this mean that you cannot somehow have a, a, a gift of intellect? No, I'm not implying that. I'm not implying that. God can use you even if you have a gift of intellect. But what we're doing here is we're challenging uh, the love, uh, the love of God in our action versus the knowledge of what we may perceive concerning the things of God. Sometimes we can be so consuming of what we need to acquire in respect to who God is that we miss Him in our very actions that are calling us uh, or that, that, is, that, that is calling us to a deeper level of love. Paul was praying here, look what he says here, that Christ may dwell in our hearts by faith. Why is he targeting the heart? How many know that it's in the heart where love permeates? When you love with all your heart, it's a good source, a good resource. God even wants His grace to be established in your heart. It's the heart that God is targeting because He knows that the very center of you is where all things will flow when it comes to the depth of His love. That's why I believe the Word of God says that the Spirit of God sheds His love abroad your heart. Amen. So God does want us, us to love, uh, love Him with our mind. But beyond just the knowledge of that, I know i got to love you, God. I know i got to do your, the things you're calling me to do. I know, I know what your Word says. But God wants us to fall in love with His Word. Fall in love with Him. Fall in love with Jesus. So in our pursuit of study, 
the very root of it, the very grounding aspect of all we do for Jesus, the very grounding aspect of all we convey concerning God will be that of love. I guarantee you, condemnation will be eliminated, judgment will be eliminated, ostracization, if that's even a terminology, will be to, to ostracize, will be eliminated. When we perceive people that are maybe not so well uh, educated when it comes to being developed in God, and they still have a little bit of worldly things, we won't so quickly cut them. Why? Because we have the love of God permeating in us. When we perceive things that come across maybe as not so doctrinally uh, well to do, we won't just eliminate them, but we'll do what, um, uh, I, I can't remember what their names were, when they took uh, the ones aside and, and showed them the more accurate way concerning the faith. Have you ever done that? Has, you know, majority today, when we hear something that isn't so accurate, immediately we jump on the individual. I can't understand if the individual is resisting truth and they're still parading nonsense. But if the individual is willing to adjust and learn, should we be so? You know, what does the love of God call us into? Take them aside, educate them a little bit more on the ways of God. I may even say some things that could be a little bit coming short from the more accuracy that some out there have concerning God's truth. <laughs> Send it away. Let me know. And if, if it's of Jesus, He'll help me receive it the way I need to. Let's not be so uh, stunted in such a way. Let's be rooted and let the grounding of, uh, areas of all we do be rooted in love. He says, and when we're rooted and grounded and Christ is dwelling in us this way by faith, that we may be able to comprehend with all the saints. You know that when we're operating in this deep level of love, the love of Christ, come on, we need to understand who Jesus really is. I think there's a lot of misrepresentations uh, of wh who Jesus looks like. How many know he's meek, he's lowly, he's loving? Even when he was blasting the Pharisees, do you know that the very, uh, the very uh, root of why he was doing that was to love them? He was breaking them with a hammer. That's why he was calling them whitewashed tombs full of dead man's bones. He wasn't just condemning them, he was breaking them. And then in turn, some Pharisees even got saved. Nicodemus in the nighttime came to visit Jesus. Nicodemus was a Pharisee. Believe it or not. So, guess what? His ministry was very effective, Jesus. Why? Because he did it with love in mind. Some of us got to come back to that place and say, Lord, I'm out here. I'm doing what I'm doing. But, that, Lord, am I moving in the knowledge of man? Am I a little bit puffed up in my delivery? Help me, Lord, to come back to the intensities of love. And let that be the root of all the things I do. Because in the midst of that, there's a comprehension that's corporate amongst the saints. When love is present and God is building and edifying, there's a comprehension that, that moves among the saints, beloved. <laughs> Not he didn't, And he didn't say amongst the churches alone. He said amongst all, look what he says. He says that you may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height. How many know that he's constructing something here? Breath, depth, I mean breath, length, depth, height. He's constructing something here. I wonder if it has something to do with the New Jerusalem. And he says in verse 19, he says, to know the love of Christ. I love that. He's building up, he's constructing, he's edifying with the breath. The length, the depth, and the height. He's constructing spiritually something that we may come into a knowledge of the love of Christ. Now this knowledge is a unique knowledge from the intellectual uh, conceptions of human reasoning. The knowledge that's perceived here is not a knowledge to know the love of Christ. It's to be in acquaintance with the love of Christ. To be in experience. To be in a shared acquaintance of the love of Christ. Not so much a hindsight of, of, of perception. Not so much an acknowledging of it, but not taking part of it. There's a deep fellowship that comes when our hearts are permeating with Christ, the love of God. And it says this love, to know this love, that's what he says here in verse 19 of Ephesians 3, and to know the love of Christ, listen, which passes knowledge. 
that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now, isn't that a contradiction? He says, to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge. How, how is this thing working here? How can you know this love if this love is surpassing? Can we even retain it? So obviously there is some kind of a, a, a wisdom that's being unleashed here when in respect to the love of Christ. How many know that principle reigns over a novice? There's something that's principle here that God wants us to capture. It's the very love of Christ. God is when, when Jesus is responding to the scribes who document things constantly, who are writing things constantly, giving the letter constantly, there's a spirit that's deeper, intensely conveyed in Jesus' response in Mark 12 versus the scribes. When Jesus says, you love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and the scribes say you love him with all your heart and your understanding, there's a difference here that's being conveyed. And yet still Jesus applauds uh, their response and it's case closed. No more questions are being risen in respect to uh, who the Lord is. It says here in 34 of Mark 12, 34, Mark 12, 34, when Jesus saw that he, speaking of the scribe, answered discreetly, discreetly. He, I wonder what that means. I think it has, a, has an element of precise. <laughs> Let's go there. Hold on a minute. Mark uh, 12, Mark 12 and uh, verse, Mark 12 and verse uh, uh, 34, Mark 12, 34, and he said he answered discreetly. Okay, in a mind having way, prudently, discreetly. One, uh, one, uh, one here even tonight uh, is in communicating intelligently. Let's look up that word discreetly, really quick. To be discreet. Just one second here. Discreet. Discreetly. Just give me one minute. Just gonna look this. Uh, D I S. Discreet. Discreet, discreetly, prudently, okay, circumspectly, cautiously, okay. Prudently seems to be a, a word that keeps rising up. Let's see a more intense uh, definition. Prudently, with prudence, with due caution, to be discreet. Now, let's, uh, I know we looked at discreetly, but just one second, we'll look at that word discreet. To be discreet, it is sometimes written discreet, okay, to. Uh, distinct between discreet, okay, or immature, okay, perhaps the literal sense is separate, okay, reserved, discerning, prudent, wise in avoiding errors or evil, wise in avoiding errors or evil, in selecting the best means to accomplish a purpose. Circumspect is one terminology that's used. You can say intelligently, but they're using the terminologies of circumspect to be wise in avoiding error. So, it's, so Jesus is saying, when, so it says here, it doesn't even say that Jesus communicated this. It says that Jesus perceived this. It says here in verse 34, when Jesus saw that he answered discreetly. When he saw that he answered discreetly. How many know that there was an element of sincerity involved in this scribe's response? By what we read here concerning what Jesus saw, what Yeshua saw in the answer of the scribe, I'm telling you that th this is evidence that the scribe was being sincere. He wasn't mocking, uh, oh yeah, well, you know, yeah, you answered pretty good, master. No, he was meaning what he said, well said, master. And he refers to Jesus as master. As master. As master. When he starts off the question in Mark 12, 28, it says, One of the scribes came, having heard them reasoning together, perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, Which is the first commandment of all? Do you see this? There's no introduction of honor here. When the scribe comes, he's challenging uh, Jesus now. But at the end of Yeshua... His answer, at the end of what he communicates, the scribe is calling him 
well master in his answer. He's referring to him as master even, can be translated rabbi even, probably close to that. So at one point, he's questioning him and challenging him. At the next point, he's showing honor and submission. And Jesus says, and it says here, when Jesus saw that he answered in this discreet fashion, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. Powerful. Do you see? I'm almost confident that the Spirit of Christ was pulling on that scribe. Come on, ask me the question. I'm almost confident that Jesus was like, the Spirit of Christ was moving in that scribe. Ask me. Come on, ask me. I want to reap you today. I want to reap you. I want to make you ready to see who's speaking here. Because it is not a lie. The Messiah is present. And in his boldness to ask Jesus, he, his soul is submitted to the very darling of heaven. And how does he win him? In the greatest commandment of all, in revealing the intensity of this, God, I love God. God, I love God. And even though the scribe responds, yeah, you know, you, he said, well said, Master, love him with all your heart and your understanding. Jesus perceives his understanding and answers him in accordance to the intellectual response he's given. The wise, cautious, it's a cautious response that he gave him. That's what that discreet word is, looks like. He was cautious in his response. And Jesus said, you're not far from the kingdom of God. It's love, saints of God. It's love. Knowledge puffs up. You think everybody is excited about how much you know. What did somebody say? Nobody cares about how, how much you, you know. How much you know until they uh, see that you care. See that you, yeah, how much you care. Something along those lines, right? Something along those lines. But how many know that there comes a time when you still have to bring this truth to the table, amen? You got to bring it. You got to bring it. Like sometimes we think that, you know, if we just do all types of good deeds, the individual is just going to somehow snap in a reality that, no, you got to minister truth. Amen. And here Jesus was ministering the truth. Jesus went, he addressed the scribe right back to the Torah. Word for word from the Torah. And even brought, uh, even brought a blossom to it in his conveying. The manner by which Jesus responded with this command, commandment was moving. That the scribe came under submission to the very love that was, that was moved by the response of, of Jesus in this movement, in this response to his question. So my question is, how are we doing in our love walk with God? Some of us are out here, we're doing it well. Can we honestly say that the love of God is moving through us in, in, our, in, our, in our presentations of truth that we're bringing? In our studying, are we studying to acquire intellect? of God, to know about God in an intellectual way, or are we studying because we just love Him? Your word, oh God, I've hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. What's that mean? I just love you. I'm just, your, your words are so precious. Your thoughts are greater than the sand of the sea. You know? And sometimes you got to labor your love. You're in the word of God, and sometimes you don't feel the call to even be in it. Sometimes you're like, this is exhaust. What am I doing? Sometimes it's not even a, a, an awesome moment when you're in the Word, but you're so devoted to God, in the Word of God, because you love God, you're like, Lord, and it breaks you past that numb feeling. Some of us are in a dull position because we haven't given ourselves to the Lord in His Word, and we're coming back to that, and we don't sense the... Uh, joy of it in, in our first engagement. But as you continue, things will bro break open. God will break open the fallow ground and love will spring up in you and you will be overwhelmed by what His Word produces in your love for Him. Come on. This is intense. This is the root of Jesus. Why did God send His only Son for us? Come on. We're talking on the Lord now. We're talking on the commandment of God. You know, you love God. You keep His commandments because His love has been moved in you. Your faith in Jesus is rooted in... Come on, remember when you opened your eyes, you just fell so in love with the God you can't see? How is that possible? Spirit of Christ, Spirit of Jesus was moving in you, who loves you so much that He's there being ripped apart and being poured out all His blood. Exficiation.
Revolution, I think they call it, to the point uh, where he's, he, he's, he's got to lift up to breathe and all his blood's being poured and he's saying, Father, forgive them. Do you think he's just saying that? Just to be an example? He loves us, beloved. God created us from his heart. God created us, and the enemy's trying to target that, that very uh, aspect of God as our creator. He loves us like a father. He's so dear to us. The very reason his word came and put on flesh, the very reason his son, the very glory of the father was revealed is because he loved us. Come on, G I, I believe that the Lord's going to just uh, shock some of us intensely with his love. He's just going to awaken us in intense ways uh, concerning his love. Concerning his love. So I encourage you, as you're seeking the Lord, as you're going about his works, as you're seeking to build on the rock, let's ask the Lord to help us to be intensely in love, not only with him, but also with one another and our neighbors. Amen. Come on, let's ask the Lord just to consume us with his love. You know, in these last days, you know, the word of God says that offenses are going to come and the love of many are going to wax cold. The love of many are going to wax cold. I even think that that word love there is translated agape, which is one of the strongest forms of love. Waxing cold? How is this possible? The love of many, because offenses will abound. People are going to hate one another. In the body? People are going to start hating one another? The love of many will wax cold. I'm telling you, this is what is coming, Jesus said. And we're, some of us are experiencing this even today where our hearts are, are being dimmed. Let's, let's, um, let's, uh, uh, let's spark that uh, menorah that God's placed in us. The Spirit of God. How? Let's, let's come to the Lord and say, God, I love you. Help me to love you. Help me to love those around me, God. Help me to just love, 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 God. And do everything from just... The love with you, Lord, and watch how, uh, come on, I'm praying it. Join with me in this. Let's, let's get in, in, intensely in love with God and the Lord and those around us. The Lord our God. And those around us in Jesus' name. He that has my commandments and keeps them. He it is that loves me.